Welcome to the Homesteaders of America podcast, where we encourage simple living, hard work, natural health care, real food, and building an agrarian society. If you're pioneering your way through modern noise and conveniences, and you're an advocate for living a more sustainable and quiet life, this podcast is for you. Welcome to this week's podcast. I'm your host, Amy Fuel, and I'm the founder of the Homesteaders of America organization and annual events. If you're not familiar with us, we are a resource for homesteading education and online support, and we even host a couple of in-person events each year, with our biggest annual event happening right outside the nation's capital here in Virginia every October. Check us out online at homesteadersofamerica.com, follow us on all of our social media platforms, and subscribe to our newsletter so that you can be the first to know about all things HOA, that's short for Homesteaders of America. Don't forget that we have an online membership that gives you access to thousands, yes, literally thousands of hours worth of information and videos. It also gets you discount codes, an HOA decal sticker when you sign up, and access to event tickets before anyone else. All right, let's dive into this week's episode. Welcome back to this week's episode of the Homesteaders of America podcast. We have a super fun guest with us this week. I want to tell you a little bit about this guest first because I'm not sure that I've had very many local people on, and I kind of love that Mike uh, Peterson from Kenlock Farm is local. I almost said Heritage Hollow Farm, and we'll get (laughs) we'll get into that in a second. But Mike is a, a farmer here in Virginia. He's a husband to his beautiful wife Molly, a dad to two rambunctious little boys, and they're just wonderful. And he's a steward of the land in some amazing ways. So Mike, welcome to the Homesteaders of America podcast. Thank you so much, Amy. I'm glad to be on. Yeah. So why don't you tell our our listeners a little bit about you? Because obviously you don't necessarily have a huge following like some of our people do on here. So you... Nobody knows you. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, maybe a good segue into that is I am an introvert. So maybe that's intentional. I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> um, so I've been, um, as you said, we're, we're here local in Virginia. My wife and I have been in and out of uh, businesses. We owned our own business in Virginia for a while where we grazed uh, multi We had a multi-species grazing operation in Rappahannock County. And that, that's where we first came to know you and and got introduced to you um seems like lifetimes ago but i know in, in the grand scheme of things it wasn't all that long ago at any rate so own, owned a business um from there went up to a nonprofit in new york and was the director of a livestock program up there all of that kind of came about because i i i got into farming through through food which is kind of an unconventional route to get there i had a, a background in farming when I was younger. My grandparents owned a dairy in Northern Illinois. So it's one of those things as a kid, you're exposed to it and it's fun and you have 20 cousins running around and it's like, oh, you know, this is, this is fun. It's a good way to live, but it's not something as a, as a career I ever thought about that I'd get into. But it wasn't until I started to cook more that I, I got more involved in farming and agriculture and food from uh, menu planning and sourcing perspective. So the more I was responsible for planning menus, the more I got to meet local producers and what they were growing and why they were growing it. And then I think with a lot of things in life that you're passionate about, it's just one of those things that snowballs and builds and continues to snowball. Um, so it had this really cool organic effect to uh, the, the evolution of how we got back into farming. So jumped around a little bit there, but so into farming through culinary. And I've always kind of had that as a backbone and in, in some of my farming philosophies is that in the end, we need to produce a delicious product that people can relate to and that people can consume. We can do everything right from a welfare and, and uh, ecological and environmental perspective. But if what we're producing tastes like cardboard, there isn't a whole lot of a market for it. So right. I think that culinary component is is important to it. So that's always something in the back of my head that I, I try to relate to. And it's been helpful for other wholesalers and restaurants as we um, grow this particular business and gain more accounts to be able to speak some of that language too. So after we were in New York for uh, a couple of years, then we we decided that we needed to hurry back and, and get back to this area in Virginia and found a really great opportunity here at Kenlock. Yeah, that's awesome. So tell us a little bit about Kenlock Farm. What What is it? How many acres? What do you do there? 
Yeah. So it's, uh, it's a family farm. Uh, it's been in the family since the 1960s. So going on 64 years, uh, it's been, it's been owned and operated by the same family. I've been here for just over two years. So a relatively short period of time and, and the, the lifetime of the farm, um, it's seen different iterations of, of what it does. It was, uh, they housed a registered Devon herd for quite a while. It was a commercial cow calf operation. It was an Angus seed stock operation. It wasn't until two and a half years, um, three or three, I guess, Three to four years ago, the family started to have some conversations about direction and, and business and perhaps steering away from seed stock and getting into producing uh, direct market beef. Um, and when I say seed stock, they're, they're selling bulls and heifers and cows and calves to other producers that are looking for these genetics that they were producing. So two and a half years ago is when I started. And I started out of probably six to seven months of conversations with the family and, and the office and some of the staff here about what they were looking for, what I was looking for and, and how we could, how we could make a match for that. So, so what I do is I was looking for, for a situation to where I could have kind of a, a greater context of land management and not, not just the day-to-day -day of moving cows and direct marketing and raising beef, but to have to, to zoom out a little bit and to have a greater context of land management, ecosystem services, conservation practices, and how that all relates into beef production. So that, that's a, a big cornerstone of, of what Kinlock is. The family has been, they were involved in the foundings of the Piedmont Env Environmental Council. Um, oh, okay. There's, there's uh, Virginia Working Landscapes they've been involved in for quite a long time. So just very deep roots to conservation in the area. So that is a, it's, it's been a guiding light as we develop this business and grow the business that all of our production practices are intertwined with conservation. So we have to be in a position to where we can say we can produce beef in an ecological manner that performs an ecosystem service. So we're a little unique in that way, but I hope it doesn't, you know, I hope in 15 years that, or 10 years that isn't unique, but that there's more people that are understanding these concepts that we can use cattle as a tool to transform ecosystems and increase grassland bird habitat and water retention and carbon sequestration and all these really cool things uh, that that you can use cattle to do. So what Kinlock does is, is utilize those tools within our land base to produce grass-fed beef. We have about a thousand acres in pasture between cool season perennial and, and native warm season grass. We have another uh, 200 in native meadows and savannas and Another 30 acres in riparian areas. We do a lot of work with John Marshall Soil and Water Conservation District for excluding cattle out of streams so they don't have access to the stream banks and deposit a lot of manure, uh, nitrogen, things like that in the fresh water. So they're fenced out of those. Conservation becomes a cornerstone of, of all of our production and, and why we do what we do. We have... Um, just cattle, which coming from a multi-species background is kind of a nice break to focus on just cattle and, and the impact that they can have on an ecosystem. Um, so about 550 head on a thousand acres is what we currently have. Wow. That's amazing. So this is totally different than what you and Molly were doing before you, you know, you guys had this farm in Rappahannock County and you were growing, you know, pigs and cows and, and chickens and all of these things. You were basically a, an essentially a small polyface. And for, to give you guys some context, like Rappahannock is a very small community. And so it was a really big deal when Mike and Molly would like have their cows go from one field to the other and we'd, you know, they'd stop traffic in the middle of the road and let, you know, animals go across. And so it's really fun. I feel like you guys really set a tone here um, in this area for homesteaders and for farmers. It seems like forever ago, but like you said, it wasn't that long ago, but it's very inspirational because, you know, now you're doing even, even bigger things. And so one of the reasons I brought you on today um, is because I do want to talk to you about soil and native grasses. And those are things that a lot of people are starting to get into learning about now. But what I think a lot of homesteaders and farmers are realizing is they really don't understand anything about it at all. And so, I mean, I'm one of those people, like when we moved here, I think I even talked to Molly about this a little bit. The, there were patches, like random patches in our front field that had moss growing in them, but they weren't near any trees. They weren't near, you know, any kind of wet area that you would think they were. And so that's when I really realized I have no idea what I'm talking about or have any knowledge on when it comes to pasture and how do we make pasture better and, you know, where do people go to find that information? So for you guys who are listening, we actually, we brought Mike on as a speaker this year at HOA. So you can learn from Mike too, um, in October if you come, but, um, Mike, for people who are listening, 
Let's talk about the soil first. You know, what basic soil, we can even start with just Virginia soil if you want, but um, how can people kind of figure out what their ground needs, what their pasture needs? Maybe what are some signs that their pasture actually needs something? Um, and how do they go about figuring that out? Sure. Great question. I, I, I like to take this approach of, of like, not many of us really know much because I think if you, if you, if you approach this with a sense of humility, it's like, then you're open to learning more every day. So I think everyone has different, right. different levels of experience and have been doing this with different perspectives for different periods of time, but to approach it with humility, it's like, I, I, I hope to learn something new every day and I hope I'm humbled. And by the time you figure out, you think you got something, then you're, you're throwing a curveball and you learn something all over again. So I think agriculture and farming and, and cattle farming is a really great way of, of humbling you and doing that too. So for, from a soil perspective, and you touched on it a little bit when you were just talking about our time in Rappahannock, but I think about soil as, a, as it relates to, to community as well, because it has to start. It's not something, if you're trying to improve your soil, it's not something you can do by yourself with one specific tool. If you're trying to get entrenched into a community, it's not something you can necessarily do by yourself and expect really quick, rapid results. It's something that takes time. It's something that takes an organic kind of a, a regenerative cycle and regenerative approach to building community, building soil, and improving the quality of your soil. As, as a baseline to start, we like to use observation. So there's certain things that we can do, whether we have cattle at different densities grazing for, you know, we could do 500,000 pounds an acre and put them on a 12-hour move, or we can have 50,000 pounds of cattle on an acre and they're on a, you know, a seven-day move or something like that. So we can we can do different things to see how how nature responds to it and see how the pasture reacts to it. And that's all scalable, whether you have a quarter acre or whether you have 10,000 acres, you can do these things. Um, I think to start off, the biggest thing for me that I'd recommend is a, is a basic soil test. And that's something that your extension agent can do. Um, we, we have CFC here, but the local co-op can also do that for you so that you have a basic reading of, of what's happening, kind of a, a chemical readout of what's happening in the soil. One step up from that would be to have more of a biological soil test done. So that tells you how things within the soil are interacting with each other and is nitrogen available or is it being locked up by, by something else. So there's um, Haney test is what that's called. And that's a really great tool to see how biologically active your soils are. Organic matter is important. pH is important. I think that the, the biggest thing with this though, is just to be patient because if you have, we, every three years we, we get soil tests done here, which for us, we're not making hay, we're not doing crops. It's just a good cycle for us to be on because we're, we're not, really large into amendments either. So every three years, we can get an update of how our soils are doing, what changes we've seen after we've been doing different management strategies across the farm. So depending on who you work with, after you get your soil test back, you can get a, a recommendation or a readout back to say that this, this needs 2,000 pounds of chicken litter per acre and 1,500 pounds of lime per acre or, or whatever to, to address the pH values or nitrogen levels or, or whatever. But I think what's important and I, I rarely do anything with those, with the recommended inputs. It's just, it's interesting to see that those are the quick fixes that are recommended. Because if you put chicken litter down, it's going to give you the quick boost of nitrogen that you need and your forage is going to explode. But I sort of equate poultry litter or any nitrogen application to steroids. It gives you a really quick boost of really good forage production, but then three to four years down the road, it's going to set you back. And then you're consistently on that cycle of needing to rely on those crutches to give you productivity. And all of that is just kind of masking, you know, whether mismanagement or, or something else that's that's not happening within your soil. So the, the long answer to your question is soil samplers are, are a really great place to start. And it's a good way to set the metric of how you're performing and how your pastures are performing. Forage species analysis is also a really good one as well, because that tells you what what's available to your livestock as they as they graze. So what the soil tells you isn't necessarily what the animals are getting. So you can also have your forage tested to see what the nutrient readouts are in your forage. Okay, good idea. I didn't even think about that. Hey, thanks for listening. We're going to take a quick break to introduce you to one of our sponsors that has been with HOA for a few years, and that's Premier One Supplies. At Premier One, they've been providing electric fencing and electric netting, sheep and goat supplies, clippers and shears, ear tags, poultry products, and expert advice for over 40 years. Whether it's electric netting for your chickens or cattle or horses or poultry, or clippers and shears and even poultry supplies such as fencing, feeders, waterers, egg handling supplies. 
hatchery items. They have it all. They are a one-stop shop for all things homesteading, just like many of our sponsors. Check out Premier One Supplies at premieronesupplies.com and don't forget to check them out at the HOA event this year. So let's take our pasture, for example. I'm going to give you a scenario, which is a lot of people's scenarios that I'm finding. If someone has, you know, say five acres, which is very common for a homesteader, and most of that five acres is is open pasture, obviously, when we get into woods, I know we get into so many other different things. But if they have, you know, animals on it that are you know, mostly like fescue. I know fescue is a big talk with cows, maybe not so much beef cows, but dairy cows um, and other remnants. And someone is trying to maybe add some different grasses to that area. So one of the things I've heard is that you shouldn't even think about planting grass seed of different types of native grasses yet until your soil gets under control because it won't grow. Um, is that something that, you know, is true or how how would people go about like implementing growing new things in their pasture, especially on a smaller scale, maybe not like a larger scale, but are there grasses they need to look out for that'll choke out those native grasses? Is it even worth their time if, if you know, if they haven't tested their soil yet? You know, we have a friend who, who did go to CFC, got their soil tested, and they made a recommendation for like a certain seed mix for them. And that seed mix is doing great. But my question is always, well, would another seed mix have done just as good? Does it really matter? What's How does somebody kind of go about learning about that? Sure. CFC, your extension agent, is a good place to start. There's also another book, Native Forages of the Eastern U.S., which is a good one. That it's it's a it's a really easy guide, both for identification and then and then what the forages are, where that where they thrive, why they thrive. Fescue is a tough one because there's it's so prevalent and it grows really well, which is why it was introduced here because it'll grow anywhere. You know, I, I'm of the perspective that it's it's here. There's there's a place for it. It's kind of found its niche niche mm-hmm. within the ecosystem. We've sort of been developing cattle to to thrive on that and adapt to it, um, which is you know another thing for sourcing livestock, whether it's sheep or goats or cattle or you know kind of kind of any ruminant. They have to be somewhat adapted to fescue to be able to do well on the East Coast. I'm also a believer that if we allow the pasture enough time and if we can apply certain management principles to it there's also the potential for the native seed bank to be able to express itself too so some of that is involved with management if you if you're if you're set stocked if you have animals on it all the time what's in the native seed bank or what's in the soil bank doesn't necessarily have time to grow or necessarily have time to flourish if we can manage our our livestock no matter the class of livestock to be able to adaptively graze them through an acre or five acres or, or 5,000 acres, it doesn't matter, but to be able to follow a concept of some periodic disruption. So you want to be able to sometimes disturb pastures, but not in the same order or not for the same reason. Um, you want to allow the pasture to rest and then you want to graze it not at the same time, not at the same place or not for the same reason every year. So to be a little bit periodic and creative um, within our management will really allow a lot of the native seed bank to grow and flourish. I know some people that aren't using seed at all. They just, they, they, they manage their livestock in a way that allows for a highly diverse forage base to be able to grow and thrive, but they're providing the soil and the pasture, the conditions for what it needs for those native seeds to be able to express itself. We do a little bit of both. So we rely on some native seed bank to flourish. Um, we also introduce some native warm season species. We, most of our seeds, we get through Ernst. They're based here in the Northeast. So that we, that's pretty well proven that the seed mixes and the seeds they provide do well here. Here, we, we have about 100 acres of, of native warm seasons that we've planted. And those areas were identified for soil condition and topography and kind of where they fit within our overall system too. So you really, I think the, the, the king to all of this though is to have a highly diverse pasture mix and you don't necessarily need to have, you know, some warm season here, some cool season there, but really uh, interspersed within itself is the way to go. Yeah. We, um, we actually bought some native seed mix. It's still sitting in my house. I should have planted it in the fall, but I didn't get around to it. And so we actually bought it based on Molly's recommendation, asking you through Molly, (laughs) um, what, what to get. And we ordered from them and they were great. They did a great job at uh, getting stuff out to us, but, um, you know, so that brings me to the next question. So you, you've you done this on multiple scales. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what rotational grazing looks like 
on, you know, your 1000 acre Kenlock farm versus maybe a five acre homestead here in Virginia? I think, yeah, I think the the great thing about it is that it's, it's applicable at, at any size. So just different logistics that we're working with and the, you know, the different kinds of materials that you need. I think some of the, the biggest considerations are fence and water. And if you, and if with rotational grazing to you, you want to make sure that you have everything the animal needs within the fencing you provide. So there's no motivation for them to go out and look for something somewhere else at the neighbors or across the street or anything. So you can set it up a few different ways. And if you, you know, you, if you have a central watering system, you can do pie wedges off of that. So if you have a five acre pasture, you can do five one acre sections. Um, you could do 10 half acre sections, but if you have a perimeter fence, you can use portable poly wire with a solar electric charger. Some setups, you wouldn't even have to move the water tank. You can just rotate that, that portable wire around the water. The biggest thing is that you are a, that you're giving the animals what they need in any given day. So we're not limiting them, um, but we can use them, use them as a tool when needed. Um, but that we're also using that we're designing this rotational grazing system to account for seasonal fluctuations or, you know, different climatic conditions. They have shade that they need, or they have wind breaks or shelter from snow, you know, what have you, but they have, they have what they need inside of the acreage that you've provided them with. The biggest thing is that it's set up. So they have, whether it's a one day move or a three day move or whatever the duration is, it doesn't matter, but that you're also back fencing them off of the area where they grazed. Um, grass starts to grow within three to five days, depending on the species. So you really don't want to leave them in one spot for more than three days, unless you're doing it for a reason, unless you want to intentionally overgraze or intentionally set fescue back to prepare for a seeding. Ideally you're keeping them in one spot for no more than three to four days, moving them into the next section and then letting that area rest. If you have, if you do a three-day move in five sections, you're you're already at, if I'm doing my quick math right, 15 days of rest before you would get back to the next section. On our scale, we're looking for anywhere from 60 to 90 days of rest. We have a, a five-acre paddock for 180 cow-calf pairs, as an example. Um, so, but it's the same concept is that that group can be on a 24 hour move and five acres. They don't have access back to that five acres when we, when we move them again. And on a, a five acre homestead, if you're doing one acre sections, it's not huge, gigantic moves, you know, a, a long distance. You're taking up the poly wire a little bit, putting them in, in the next section, putting the back fence up behind them, and then they have a brand new section. So mm-hmm. we found that serves a whole lot of benefits from nutrition and pasture health, but also for animal health and well-being. though they're not, they don't have access back to their manure and urine and other things that they've deposited for the 24 hours. It helps with fly control and parasite resistance. And there, there's a whole host of benefits that it has aside from just pasture health. Yeah. So do you, I know one of the things that a lot of people are researching right now is having multiple species in a section of rotational grazing at one time. So like sheep and cows is a common one. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Is that something that you guys do and whether you do or not, what are the benefits of multi multi-species grazing together? I'm a big fan of that. And if you, if you think about the historical context of that, there were always large ruminants or herbivores that would come through the great plains first. We've heard, we've heard stories of bison roaming the great plains, and then it was followed by smaller species and smaller species. And then birds and poultry and other things would come in behind them, which is similar to, you, you brought up polyface earlier, but in a farm like that with a multi-species operation can have larger animals with, with poultry followed behind them as, you know, coming through last for nitrogen. And then they scratch them through the manure and spread out the manure and things like that too. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of multi-species and I've done, um, or I've been at farms that have, we've grazed sheep and cattle together. I've done together. I've done leader follower to where the cows go first and then the sheep come in behind them. In the end, I, I was, I was a big fan of, of them grazing together. That one of the a consideration was uh, mineral access. Cause usually cattle mineral is higher in copper and sheep don't have as high of a tolerance to copper as cattle do. I hadn't found an issue with that. This is not veterinary advice, but we, the, the free choice salt and mineral that we use didn't have the high copper levels that are, are toxic to sheep. So I, I never had an issue with that. And, and sheep are very trainable to poly wire as well. I've, I've been in systems where you can use two strands of poly wire. I've been in systems where they have to use netting. 
Um, and netting is kind of a pain in the butt to, <laughs> to use on, on any kind of a scale. I think we're all probably somewhat familiar with that, but mm-hmm. where I can avoid netting, I will. Yeah. Same. So, <laughs> yeah. Training, training sheep to polywire was big, you know, when they're, uh, when cattle and sheep are together, if you're grazing them together with rotational grazing, I mentioned the benefits for parasite resistance and, and things like that too. They're, they're really good dead end hosts for parasites. So the pH levels in each of the uh, sheep's room and in a cow's room is different. So they're dead end parasite hosts for each other. There's more of, a, of an effect on that if you're doing a leader follower. So cattle go first, um, then the sheep would come in behind them, essentially consume the, the larvae of the parasites that the cows have deposited, dead ending them in the sheep's gut, vice versa for the, for the cow and the sheep. So they're very cohabitive and they're very cohesive and they're that way for a reason. There's, there's, there's a reason that just works in nature because they were designed to, to uh, live together within the same ecosystem. We don't do that here at Kinlock. We just have cattle here, but I'm not, right. I'm not blind to the effect that multiple species could have a positive outcome here on, on the ecosystem, on, on the pasture. And then from a marketing perspective too. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, when we had sheep, we kind of did the same thing. Our cow, we only had one cow, like y'all don't think we had multiple ones, but, but our cow really loved our sheep. And, um, we just, you know, we loved having them together too, just for the, you know, the community aspect mm-hmm. of sheep and cows together. It was super cute to see them, but. And a, a couple more benefits too, while I'm thinking of it, we had, um, labor is another big one. You know, labor is a big one for any rotational grazing system is you have to be, it has to be efficient. It has to be easy. And I think easily translatable. So whether it's, mm-hmm. I'm asking an intern to go out to do it or, seven-year-old son. <laughs> it has to be something simple that that someone can do. So it's a system that's easily designed, that can save time and is easily translated. We we also saw benefits of, of keeping them together for predator control as well. Yeah. We had uh, for sheep, you know, there's, there's a lot of coyotes out in this area. And we've seen that the cows, especially cows with calves, are naturally protective of their calves. So they did a really great job of keeping the coyotes out of the pasture sheep are very susceptible to, to coyote attacks and kills and things like that. So that was another barrier of, of protection for us is keeping them together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's one of the reasons we liked having, uh, the cows with the sheep too, is we have massive, I mean, you know, from really living in Rappahannock, some of them are massive, those coyotes. And so, um, it was, it was nice to have them. Okay. Going back to native grass seed, you posted, I guess it was maybe in the fall, you posted a video on social media of just a super tall, lush grass. Virginia had gone through a drought, but this grass was just beautiful and green and cows were grazing on it. Um, I wonder if you might talk to that a little bit because I really enjoyed seeing that in your, you know, your caption you had with it about how to maintain property well. Yeah. Wasn't that cool? Yeah, it, <laughs> it was, was. We went through, yeah, we went through, there was a pretty significant drought here this summer and into fall. And that, I, th- I think if I remember that, that poster, that location, right, it was a 20 acre field with, uh, it was Indian grass, big blue and little blue were the th- three species that we had planted in there. And it was, it was the only thing green on the farm. Um, and we were moving a group of, uh, it was 30 head that were, they were our, our we keep a, a smaller group of finishing stock or the animals that are closest to harvest in a smaller group. And we're essentially just keeping the best grass in front of them to try to keep positive weight gain on them. And that like this fall was a really hard time to do that because everything had, had browned yeah. out essentially. And we were, we were very short on rain, which is, you know what do they say on the East coast? You can be into a drought in a week and out of a drought in a week, which is kind of the situation we found ourselves in. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't we see that happen? Yeah. (laughs) Um, For real. But those things are so resilient because the roots are so, so deep and it's, it's beneficial for nutrient absorption for the minerals that are available to the cattle and also for drought resilience. You know, there's those root systems can be four to seven feet deep, depending on the, the species of grass that it is, but it does take time for those to establish. So going back to the patience thing, you have to be patient when you're establishing those and not be too aggressive and raising them too soon. Uh, they operate off of a different timeline of when they're productive and when you can graze them and when you shouldn't graze them. We have a couple of pure stands of those. Um, so they're not fields that we can feed hay on, or we don't overwinter on those because they're, they're, they're really, really good from May through September outside of that window. We, we stay off of them. We leave some standing for wildlife habitat, um, some seed for migrating birds that are coming through in the winter that, uh, you know, a different food source than we would have in our cool season pastures. But those, those warm seasons were, were a lifesaver for us this fall, for, for that group in particular to keep some positive weight gain on them. 
Um, we also took a group of 150 stalkers through 200 acres of our meadows, which hadn't, hadn't really been grazed before, but that's a, it's a composition of native warm seasons and forbs and wildflowers and things like that. So we saw multiple benefits from having kind of, you know, three different distinct grazing ecosystems here from cool season to pure stand of native warm season to a native meadow savanna concept. Yeah, that's really neat. I bet it's incredible to see the difference in and all that. And it's like I said, I'm sitting here listening to you talk because you know about all this stuff, right? Like it's been your life. And it is really interesting to to be so intimate with, you know, nature and how that grass is growing and when it's best to graze it. And um, those are things that I know a lot of homesteaders and farmers really want to learn. So I'm excited. I'm listening to you talk. I'm excited about you talking in October at the conference because I know you're going to get a lot of questions from people. Okay. A few more questions and I'll let you go because I know you're busy. Sure. The first thing is you've talked about minerals a little bit, whether it's getting their minerals and nutrients from the grass or what's in the soil or having loose minerals available. For just the average everyday person, I know obviously a soil test will help and the forage test will help, but what are just some common things that people should have on the hand for their livestock, especially ruminants um, in regard to like mineral, whether it's loose mineral or whatever you tend to recommend? I am a, I'm a, I'm a minimalist. So I, 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 and I say that after having done robust mineral programs and things that we didn't need because that was kind of the hot topic or the thing that people were doing um, mm-hmm. as something to try. So I've, I've tried the cafeteria programs where you put out, you know, the 20 individual minerals in a sled and the animal goes through and self selects. Um, I've done that. I've done the basic co-op mixed mineral, what we've settled on now. And, and this direction that I really like is something we just started a year ago. So I think that's the whole humility thing and, and constant evolution is that you once you have new data or new science or a new product, explore it and see if it's the right fit for your operation. Talk to people that are using it and then try it because you know, you're know you not going to hit a home run if you don't take a swing. So sometimes you just need to try something new. We're using just salt currently. So we're using C90 as our only salt supplement. I, I don't get into crazy mixed minerals and, and, and custom mineral mixes for different classes of livestock. So salt is essential to complete a lot of functions for, for livestock, whether it's a cow or a sheep or a goat, um, can be toxic to pigs. So don't, don't give pigs too much salt, but you know, C90 with a little bit of kelp goes a long way and that's what we've settled on now. So I, I'm, I, I like the free choice so they can, they can lick it. The li- the blocks can sometimes be, you know, they don't get enough of what they need. That does just sit there and lick the block yeah. for a long period of time. They can be more weather resistant, but they're the uptake and the absorption can be a little bit slower and, I think if I were a cow, similar to the mineral sled, I'd, I'd get bored of needing to go through to pick 20 right. different minerals. I'd get bored of sitting there licking a block when there's delicious grass to go eat. So the, the loose mineral is a win for us. We keep it covered to keep the elements out. You don't have to. I know other people that don't. And, and C90 with a little bit of kelp is what we've what we've settled on right now. There's also a, a project that we're going to get into this spring is a, a C90 saltwater brine. So that's essentially just putting... C90 into a, a Rubbermaid stock trough. And it's essentially, it's, it's a saltwater brine. So the, the mineral uptake of that brine is supposed to be greater than it is if they were just to ingest the salt yeah. on their own. So another project we're going to try this spring. So that's, um, that's the Baja salt, right? It's CSEA 90. Is that what it is? Similar. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. So we, um, so one of the things that I would, they, y'all, they're not even a sponsor or anything, but I do want to talk about that for just a second because they came to conference last year and they've sponsored a couple of our conferences. Um, I don't even know if, I don't know if they're a sponsor yet this year or not, but we brought home a lot of that salt. And the one thing that I noticed, not all salt is made the same at all. Um, we've tried mineral salts in the past. And the one thing that I noticed about this salt was it, it looked moist, like it looked wet. And generally that's one of the telltale signs of a true mineral salt um, is that it has a more moist looking feature to it. If, if you've never really compared mineral salt, you, you're like, I don't even know what you're talking about, but we have, we've compared a lot of mineral salt. And so um, especially like magnesium and things, they hold on to that moisture. So I thought that was really interesting to compare those salts. I don't know if that's why you went with them or not, but um, we've really enjoyed even just the table salt that they have for people using that and implementing that in different ways here. Yeah, Baja is the, that's kind of the, the human side of their business, right? Yeah. It's a yeah. Gold it and is. C90 is a livestock. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I know, and you know, I know there's, there's plenty of folks that are doing foliar applications with C90 and, and vegetable gardens on pasture. So there's, there's a lot of good 
data and science about the positives of, of using this, whether it's through the cow or directly onto your garden or directly onto your pasture. Yeah. Super cool. Yeah. We'll look into that more. Maybe we'll do a podcast about that too. Cool. Okay. Mike, do you have anything else you want to share today with our, with our group of people or any like tidbits of wisdom? You don't have to, but I always leave it open at the end. If somebody has something they want to share. You know, I, I think I touched on it earlier, but, I, but, for me and, and my wise old age of 40. So take that into context too, but. <laughs> oh my goodness, whatever. <laughs> having, you know, I think in, in farming and agriculture and, and no matter the scale, because that's, that's completely 100% true. It's, it's to uh, approach this with, with humility is that we, we don't really know anything. We're, we're at the mercy of nature every second of every day. We, we can come into this with the best of intentions, with integrity and being authentic and knowing what we want to do and why we want to do it being, like, as I said, being intentional with our work and, and putting a plan into action and seeing that go through and then, and then manage off of feedback. So you're constantly managing off of what you're seeing and deviating and changing. And I think it's so important as, as producers that we are adaptive to that. We're not, we're not prescriptive in anything that we're doing. We're responding to mother nature, who's very dynamic. We're responding to animals that need different things all the time. And they're, you know, they'll, come down with ailments and um, other things that we have to respond to. But in the end, we have to, we have to, I think it's just important that we approach our, all of our work with, with humility and a deep appreciation for respect of, of, of the animal of nature and the, the greater community that we're involved in. Yeah, I think that's great. And I actually was having that conversation with someone earlier today and how, you know, they asked me the question I was doing a, a podcast earlier for some for someone else's podcast and um they said you know what's what's your biggest thing that you tell homesteaders and i said that the biggest thing is you know just to remember you're going to fail it doesn't matter if you've been doing this for 1 year or 30 years or you know you're always learning something new and something's always changing or the animal is different than the animal you had before and and so it, it is a really great way to keep us humble and keep us learning and and just kind of remembering remembering our place right so and if, I if you're not failing, you're not trying. So exactly. you, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to try and you have to be okay with failing because that's just an opportunity to learn. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you for joining us on this week's episode of the Homesteaders of America podcast, Mike. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Amy. Hey, thanks for taking the time to listen to this week's Homesteaders of America episode. We really enjoyed having you here. We welcome questions and you can find the transcript and all the show notes below or on our Homesteaders of America blog post that we have up for this podcast episode. Don't forget to join us online with a membership or just to read blog posts and find out more information about our events at homesteadersofamerica.com. We also have a YouTube channel and follow us on all of our social media accounts to find out more about homesteading during this time in American history. All right, have a great day and happy homesteading. <music>